welcome to our last uh, webinar for 2021. This is a, a really, really good one and, and uh, dear to my heart. Steve Lexon has stirred up a lot of dirt in his time. Over four decades, much of his work, uh, archeological research was focused on Chaco Canyon starting with the National Park Service uh, Chaco project, followed by surveys of the extensive canyon region, and later some Chaco outliers uh, at Bluff, Utah, and Chimney Rock, um, done by the University of Colorado. Um, after these field projects came the National Park Service-sponsored multi-year Chaco synthesis. Uh, he was the director of a sizable cast of researchers, and most recently now is um, junior partner with Dr. Ruth Van Dyke and Dr. Carrie Heitman in Chaco Landscapes. So his presentation today is an autobiography of a set of ideas about one of the most important archeological sites in the Southwest. Chaco, since 1974, in and around Chaco, not continuously, obviously, that, uh, on and off, I, I had equal research interests in southern New Mexico and the members' country, and worked a bunch of other places too. And on the side, I had to make a living. But uh, our two decades in particular, from 74 to 86, that really was a full time job. When I was working at Solomon Ruins and the National Park Service Chaco Project, that was my job. Did other things for a while, and then back in 1995, um, got back to it when I had another full time job, a couple other full time jobs actually. Uh, at Bluff and Chaco Synthesis and Chaco Meridian, and I'll come back to some of this. And later in life, Chimney Rock and Chaco Landscapes just kind of showed up. But um, how I got to Chaco was uh, interesting in a way. Uh, when I was a kid, um, junior high and high school, for a few years of high school, a couple of years of high school, lived in Naples, Italy, because my dad was in the army and he was stationed there. And this is a postcard, but that really is the view we saw out of the, the apartment window. It's pretty nice. I'm very close to Pompeii and Herculaneum and Kuma and all sorts of ruins. And uh, my parents being dutiful parents, they took me and my brother around to see them all. And I thought that was pretty cool. We went to Pompeii every time Aunt Gertrude or, you know, cousin Joe Bob came, came through Naples, we would go out to Pompeii. And I thought, and this is, this is a young me, <laughs> not at Pompeii, but I think, I think at Delphi, because we, we traveled through Greece and, you know, a, a lot of, of Italy looking at old stuff. Um, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, maybe I'd be a classical archaeologist because I met a few of those people and I thought that was pretty interesting. But when I went to college, uh, they had a triage guy, an advisor, who I, I actually went to some other high schools after that. My, my dad's in the army. We were moving every year for a while. And I graduated from high school in Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, the advisor guy said, what do you want to do, kid? And I said, well, archaeology, but I like classical archaeology, like Greece and Rome. And I think he saw that I graduated from high school in Biloxi, Mississippi. He said, no, nah, you can't do that. <laughs> You can go do anthropological archaeology. What the hell is that? I didn't say that. I said, what is that? They said, oh, they, they dig up Indian mounds. I didn't, knew nothing about anthropology, nothing about Indian. You know, who would want to dig up an Indian mound? I mean, you know, you make a living doing that. But I got shunted off into, into anthropology. And uh, I was being trained to do southeastern U.S. and Mississippi Valley, which at this point I, I appreciate is really amazing prehistory. But uh, one January on a, on a lark, I went out to New Mexico with a professor who was working in the members country. And I don't know if you've seen member sites, but they're, <laughs> they're not the Parthenon, let's put it that way. They're you know, terribly impressive. But I was struck by the fact that it wasn't humid. Of course, it's January, there weren't any bugs. Um, certainly, I, I learned that there are very, far fewer ticks and all the snakes you need to worry about in the Southwest rattle, let you know they're there. That's not true in the Southeast. They don't all rattle and I'll come after you. But the main thing was I walked out the door one evening and saw the Milky Way for the first time in my life. And I said, I want to work here. I knew nothing about the Southwest. Uh, very little about it. You know, again, very little about anthropology or even New World prehistory. But I said, OK, if, if I have to do this to be an archaeologist, um, this sure beats you know, pushing through cornfields in Tennessee. Um, so I decided to be a Southwest archaeologist. And my wife can vouch for this. I decided that what I wanted to do, I wasn't too concerned. I was young and stupid. I'm old and stupid, but I was young and stupid. So I wasn't too concerned about a career, you know, being a professor or anything like that. I really didn't want to be a professor. Uh, but I wanted to work in each of the three areas of the Southwest and do something that was useful and sort of move the field forward. 
And I'd already got a start in, in Mogollon and Membris and went back there and did a lot more work. Uh, did a bit of work in Holcom that uh, some of it was useful, <laughs> some of it was not. Um, but I really wanted to work at Chaco too. I mean, those are the places that in 1973, you know, seemed like the, the hot topics in the Southwest and they were in 73. In 74, a couple of publications came out about you know, Casas Grandes and, and pre-classic Holocom, which I would have added those to my list of things to do. Um, so Chaco. Okay, and had my sights on Chaco. I'm not sure I'd ever actually been there. I read about it, and it's mostly self-educated and stuff. I was reading about it, I was talking to people, but I never had a class in Southwestern archaeology. I mean, at least not until graduate school, in which case I probably could have taught the damn course. Um, and I did later. Uh, but I knew I wanted to work at Chaco, and people have said that Lexington, you, you know, you push Chaco, you say it's important because you work there. No, I worked there because it was obvious to anybody of even, even the meanest intelligence that it was pretty important. But in 74, we didn't know that much about it. This is the hot, uh, hot textbook at the time. All right, uh, Paul Martin, who is an old, old school guy, and Fred Plogg, who is the, the bright young thing then. And then when I get to Chaco in this book, and I checked out a library, I couldn't afford to buy it, but uh, in spite of the great towns that developed there in Chaco and the interest that the region has attracted Less is really known of the Chaco area than almost any other Southwest district, which in retrospect, that's just not true, even at the time. Uh, but it's amazing that so little work has been done there and so few significant reports published, which that was the opinion of these two academics. Um, there was lots of stuff that had been published by the Park Service and by non-academics, but that apparently didn't count. And I read most of that. So I snuck up on Chaco. Uh, I was supposed to be running a big project in Northern Florida a you know, big highway salvage thing in Northern Florida. And uh, three months before I was supposed to start, I saw an advertisement for a ceramic analyst, which is that, I didn't do that, you know, as a field guy, I ran field projects. But for the San Juan Valley Archaeological Project, digging Salmon Ruins, which was a Chaco great house, you know, 40 miles north of Chaco. It was run by Cynthia and Williams, who's the woman on top of the mound there, not, not the one that's wearing nothing with the red head, but the a uh, woman in the, the white shirt and the black beret. That was her, her uh, field costume. That was Cynthia. And she was a really remarkable person. I'm not in this picture because I was up in the lab flipping shirts, uh, eventually sneaking my way into, into the field and doing some digging at, at Solon Run. So I did that for three years. What I really wanted to get on was the Chaco project, which was going on at that time. It's a National Park Service funded big project in Chaco Canyon. Okay, so you don't just like walk in down there and say, I want to work with you guys. Uh, everybody wanted to work with those guys. Um, I eventually got, not eventually, I got hired in 76 when they were staffing up to do Pueblo Alto. And that's me in far left in the back row. And I can tell you a story about how I got the job and it involves some just blatant nepotism, um, but I don't have time for that. So I worked, worked for those guys for about 10 years uh, at some, dug, excavated uh, at some small sites, but mainly at Pueblo Alto. And I was given the what they call the central room block, the east-west portion there. Uh, and working with, with Tom Wines, who was the field supervisor, and Jim Judge, who at, uh, and the Chaco Project picture on the front row on the right, that's Jim Judge, and then Marsha Truel, and Tom Wines, and Pete McKenna, all of whom I worked with over the years. Um, we figured out, I said, this is what I want to do. And, and by and large, they said, OK, fine. Um, Worked in the, the middle part of the central room block for several years, and it was quite a hoot. Uh, big, huge rooms full of rubble and blow sand, and you know, good for the upper body development, um, pick and shovel work. But then when you got to the when you got to the actual floors and the architecture, it was really cool. One of the coolest things, I mean, lots of things were cool about that. But one of the cooler things is that underneath the central room block, the middle of the central room block, the absolute center of the site. Uh, geometrically, I don't know, you know, spiritually or whatever, but there's an earlier building. Uh, see room 50 and 51. These guys, after we popped through several floors of room 142, which is what we're looking at here, there was this building, uh, earlier building, that was just as monumental and just as big in terms of its construction as the later Pueblo Alto. Pueblo Alto gets going about 1020, something like that, uh, is when they build the, the central central room block, and then they keep adding stuff on. But underneath that, there had been an earlier building that they had raised, I mean, they had leveled uh, down to the, the foundations. And the foundations you can see in the lower right were big, thick foundations, just the same as the foundations for the later uh, chocolate walls. 
and it had been used. There's all sorts of features and you know uh, sealed uh, deposits that were ceramic. You know the ceramics are all from the 850s. We've got a date out of there, the 850s too. What's sort of cool about that was that you know I had thought up to that point, and a lot of people had thought because the Turing dates, the chocolate really gets going about 910. But you know here's something that that's monumental and part of the bizarre part of Chaco. It's part of Alto, which John Fritz figured out was a north-south line that's in Clutson. Alto is on the, on the, out of the canyon on the north side, up high, Alto. And on the south side of the canyon, uh, up high, it, where you can see each other, is in Clutson. And there, it doesn't look like this in this image, but they're, they're due north-south of each other. Um, and Fritz figured out that a lot of the layout of the canyon uh, revolved around that line of, of symmetries. But it starts at 850, which is really interesting because Alto is 1020s and Clutson's a little later. There's probably something early under St. Clutson as well. I know he's dug that one, so who knows? And I got interested in the North South stuff, uh, which comes up later. So I get the Chaco Project. Uh, it's five years in, they've already done five years worth of work. And the analytical uh, responsibility has already been divided up. We would spend most of spring, summer, a lot of fall out at Chaco doing field work and come back to Albuquerque in the winter and sort sherds or study arrowheads or whatever, but there are already people sorting sherds and plus, you know, <laughs> it's not what I do, although I did. I, I flipped a lot of sherds, uh, for chocolate sherds. But I said, look, uh, you know, nobody's really, that I'm aware of, is looking at the architecture of Chaco Canyon, which is why you got a park in the first place. If you didn't have these great houses, these, these big buildings, you wouldn't have a park. You wouldn't have a Chaco phenomenon. You, you wouldn't have the Chaco project. So let's look at the architecture, not just of Pueblo Alto, which we were digging, but, but what's out there. You know, some of which had been excavated before, like Pueblo Benito, Chetra Kettle, Pueblo Del Royo, had been excavated and had, had uh, some of them had reports, and some of them didn't. But I, you know, I talked to my bosses, uh, Tom Wines and, and Jim Judge, and uh, you know, this would be useful. Uh, they said, do you have any qualifications? I said, no, but I will. <laughs> and, and went around to a bunch of architectural historians, not so much the anthropologists, you know, and other archaeologists, like classical archaeologists. They know, they know what to do with buildings. Southwest archaeologists at this point really didn't. Uh, you know, buildings are just containers for artifacts, basically. Um, and figured out, you know, what we're going to do and, and how long it's going to take and what would it cost. Um, and did it. You know, I did the ones in Chaco Canyon. And I spent a lot of time crawling on Aztec ruins. I never really wrote that up, uh, which is too bad. But I'll give you a, a for instance, this is the, the big, single biggest part of that project was Chetrico, which had been excavated in the teens and the 20s and 30s by Edgar Hewitt, Museum of New Mexico and University of New Mexico. But Hewitt never wrote it up. You know, it was a big building, big building, almost as big. Hewitt said it was bigger than Pueblo Benito. It's, he's wrong, uh, but it's you know, pretty big, second biggest after Pueblo Benito and full of interesting stuff. Uh, not so much the artifacts, but the architecture is pretty, pretty interesting. So um, we went out, we being Peter McKenna and I, okay, put together a package. And again, I had to you know, write the contracts and stuff and, and get this uh, approved by my bosses. And this was one cool thing about the Chaco projects that we had money, you know, you're not limitless money, but it wasn't like many of my projects, which are shoestring. I said, um, you know, take Peter McKenna and I would go out and do the architectural study and I'd come back and do archival studies because we had a lot of the old notes that had never been written up in the Chaco archives. And we write a contract with laboratory triggering research in Tucson to come out and do some work. Chetra Kettle had way over half, like 60 or 70% of all the triggering dates in chocolate came from Chetra Kettle. And they were a complete mess. Couldn't figure out, you know, from Hewitt's time. Couldn't figure out what went where. So they did an archival study, Hugo Betancourt, who went on to great things, uh, looked at their paperwork. And then Jeff Dean and Dick Warren came out and resampled all the exposed wood. And they had a drill with a hollow core bit and they drill into a beam and they could pull out a sample and they could date that. Um, all the while they're doing that, Peter McKenna and I are drawing all the walls. Uh, that was the uh, main thing that we did uh, for the architectural studies is draw every wall in Chaco Canyon, a, a measured uh, view, I call them um, elevations, that's tied into you know north, south, east, west, and up, down. And there's an example down below uh, is the uh, colonnade at Chetra Kettle. You know, that, that's the product. I, I redrafted all this stuff after we came out of the field. But yeah, we, did, we didn't do this for Benito because it had a lot of historic American building survey stuff. I crawled all over Benito with books in my hands and, and looked at everything I could look at. And we didn't do it for Pueblo del Arroyo, same thing. It had a published report, but crawled all over that. But the rest of the buildings out there, yeah, we, we drew every wall that we could see. 
And because it was linked in for the north, south, east, west, and up, down, you could put all these drawings together and make literally make a model. That's Dennis Holloway in the upper right put together a computer model based on our drawings. You know, we drew all those stinking walls, every one of those you know, beam sockets and doors and niches and vents and all the rest of it. The nice thing about drawing stuff is you really have to pay attention to it. Uh, you know, you're really looking right at it. It's not like these days we do this with the laser, with, la you know, with, with laser technologies and you could probably do it in a week. I mean, it took us a couple of months, I think, out of this place. But you really have to study it while you're, while you're doing it. And came back and looked at all the archival records and stabilization records and all that kind of stuff and, and put together a report on Chetra Kettle. So we finally, we wrote up Chetra Kettle. Hewitt didn't do it. We did it. That was part of the larger study, Great Polar Architecture of Chaco Canyon, that, uh, again, was, you know, I was doing lots of other stuff for the, for the Park Service at that point. But this was the, the thing where, you know, somebody was doing arrowheads and somebody's doing monos and matates. And I was doing architecture. That was my, that was my charge after they figured out that it was actually a good thing to do. Um, that got published by the Park Service in 84 and uh, went out of print real quick. So I took the last remaining copy of it over to UNM Press and I said, you know, here's this thing. It's been peer reviewed. This was not my dissertation, by the way. I said nothing to do with my dissertation. It's been peer reviewed by some pretty good people that knew what they were talking about with architecture. And, uh, it, you know, it's all paid for. It's all done. You know, all the graphics are done. Uh, and it's free because it's a government document. <laughs> There's no copyright on this. You don't have to pay me anything for it. But I would like to see a few more copies out there. And, and they took it and they, you know, they went through, I don't know how many printings were finally went out of print. And one of my major contributions in this book, I think, was <laughs> I did all the draft, draft um, me and Jerry Livingston did the drafting of this book. But this schematic of all the Chaco wall features, corner doorways, you know, T doors, this and that. And that's been redrawn a million times better than I could do. I mean, this, this is, I think, Scientific American, but I, I, I see versions of this popping up that are like seven generation versions of this drawing uh, to this day that, you know, I don't think those people even know any, where it came from. And worked on construction sequences. We had new tree ring dates. We, we had existing tree ring dates that had been sorted out, uh, some at the tree ring lab and then with Pete, Peter and Ken and I in the field figuring out that this, this date comes from this wall. And did construction sequences for all the sites. And again, this is Dennis Holloway taking some of my work and, and turning it into uh, um, computer uh, recreations of how Benito grew. And subsequently, uh, Tom Wines uh, and Danny Ford and some other people, they realized that what, what uh, Jeff Dean had done going back and, and resampling just Chetrakel in the exposed wood is really cool, really helpful. And Tom went out and did that for every other site in the canyon, which means I probably should, it didn't change too much of the construction sequences that I worked out, but it, it certainly changed some. And, uh, you know, with that I had had that kind of money at the time I was doing the study. So my things, there's a bunch of stuff in that book that mostly people ignored. It was a park service study. So, you know, the, the professors weren't gonna pay any attention to it anyway, I already knew that. But I said all these things fairly modestly, uh, not the style I would use today. Um, but yeah, great houses were mostly storage, which is interesting. You know, how do you know that, Lex? And how do you know mostly storage? From the architecture, from the doors. There's a particular kind of door that they use for storage rooms. And when we go out there and look at all the doors, almost all of them are storage room doors. And there's, you know, the, no ambiguities about that. Second thing is the kivas, all the things, the little round things that people call kivas, park service calls kivas, the tourists call kivas, even some of the Indians call them kivas, aren't really kivas, they're pit houses. They're not the first kivas. They're the last pit houses because people lived in pit houses for 500 years. And these are just flashy pit houses, which is an index of you know, household. It's part of a house, um, which gives you some way of actually calculating population out there, which has always been a problem. The entire canyon was an urban settlement. I was not the first person to say that, but I'm probably the first person. No, I pushed it more than other people did. That uh, Pueblo Benito was not one farming village, and Chetra Kettle wasn't another farming village, and Pueblo Alto wasn't another farming village. Their buildings in a, in a much larger settlement that John Fritz had worked out had actually had a layout, it had a cityscape, city plan. And the last thing that, that I talk about in the book that, as far as I know, nobody picked up on this, although it's pretty unambiguous, is that the great houses versus the small sites, because they're small sites, I'll show you this in a minute, um, are two different social classes. Uh, Gordon Vivian and figured, uh, Park Service archaeologists figured this out in the 60s, all right, that you have different kinds of people living in these kinds of places. You have one kind of people 
living in the great houses, another kind of people living in the small sites. Uh, they have different names, BC sites, unit pueblos, whatever. Um, he thought there were different ethnicities and he was probably right because where I'm going with it, uh, the people that live in the great houses and live in, the people that live in the small sites are really different people. I don't think they're different ethnicities they are all part of one civilization, but you got nobles and commoners. Uh, initially I called these elites because this, okay, this is in the eighties. And you would, you know, you don't hear, the, hear these words used in the Southwest even today, but in the 80s, you know, that would have just been crazy talk. Uh, just, I should have mentioned this, that these small sites, this is a string of regular family houses, just like they lived in all over the Four Corners before and during and after Chaco. The weird stuff are the great houses and the, the small, small sites just fit in with what everybody else is doing. And there are, these two pictures are more or less to scale. I mean, this is a, this is three family houses, all right? <laughs> side by side by side, like row houses. And you could take one of those and fit it in a single room at Benito. I mean, the differences are not subtle. You don't need a factor analysis to figure this out. When people ask me what data are for navels and commoners, I said, well, walk through Pueblo Benito and then walk across the bridge to the south side of the canyon and look at the small sites over there. And if you don't see that there's a big difference and it probably is a difference of classes, you should hang up your trowel and quit pretending to be an archaeologist. Okay, so I presented this stuff. Again, I don't have a PhD yet. 88, the first, first Southwest Symposium which has been many since. Um, and I was using terms like elite and non-elites and pretty timidly, you know, it's just saying, well, it certainly looks like there could be, blah, 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 you know, I'm maybe wrong. But... And after I got done and sat down, this guy, Henry Dobbins, who was an older, you know, senior, senior cultural anthropologist who worked in the Southwest, he comes in and looms over me, I'm sitting in my seat and, you know, I'm just this sort of ex park service guy, doesn't have a PhD, he says, Lexan, Remember the scales of societies we are studying. And I was gassed and I didn't know what to say. I mean, I didn't know what to say, and I, but I didn't say it. What I wanted to say, and what I couldn't say it to this, you know, distinguished guy with his eyebrows flying up, you know, was remember the scale of society we were studying. I thought that's what we're trying to figure out. It's the scale of societies that we're studying. That's what archaeology is supposed to do is figure that out, not make assumptions about it. And that's sort of guided my thinking ever since is that, yeah, in the Southwest, we make all these assumptions based on modern Pueblos and what happened in the past and by and large, they're wrong, which is uh, for important things, you know, key things like Chaco. Uh, that's the last book I wrote, probably ever would write. Okay, Bouncing Back in Time, that was just shortly after I got out of the Park Service. But while I was in the Park Service, I was doing this architecture, I was flipping shirts, I was going out and doing field work, but one of the main things was, was looking for outliers, small great houses that we you know, knew there was a few of them out there. Uh, everybody you know, that you talked to said, oh, there's something strange over here. It looks like maybe a 20th, it's like a 20th Pueblo Benito and you fly it out hundred miles from Chaco Canyon and you drop it in the middle of nowhere. And there are two projects, the National Park Service one in 76, which was uh, me and uh, Bob Powers and Bill Gillespie. Um, sort of see Bill Gillespie going up cracking the rock. I mean, these guys are, these guys are crazy, they, yeah. Great fun. Uh, Dr. Boss is in sending us out there in the San Juan Basin and adjacent areas in a beat up old Park Service truck. Went around looking for these things. And that's what they look like. Uh, the picture in the background there, that's John Stein, who's on the, the second big project in 77, and Rob Weiner standing next to him at Andrews Great House. About the same time we're doing that, the Park Service is doing that with us three. There's John Stein, who I just pointed out there, and Mike Marshall and Rich Luce. Uh, that we're doing similar sorts of things for the Public Service Company of New Mexico, PNM, uh, who were thinking about doing a huge coal mining operation out there and develop, you know, energy development. And it's very proactive. They got the Historic uh, Preservation Division in Santa Fe, New Mexico government, to match some money. And they went out looking for outliers. And of course, we're working together, we're all friends. We're working together, we're showing them our stuff, they're showing us their stuff. Put a lot of dots on the map. A lot of dots on the map, more than anybody had ever imagined. Hundreds of dots on the map. And the dots are these things. These are all at different ends of an area the size of Indiana. The Badger Springs is up north, Kinchiops down near uh, Camaro, uh, Camelot's down near, you know, practically true to consequences, and Bluffs, of course, in south, southeastern Utah. And it's a big bump. You know, you see a big bump uh, surrounded by a bunch of little bumps. I mean, things aren't even really bumps, they're just sort of smears. And then someplace off on the side is a great hole in the ground, which is the great, a great Kiva. And it, it becomes a, a noted repeated landscape that from one end to the other, 
they don't all have these features and they all, of course they don't all look alike. I mean, neither the two Fords off the assembly line. But you have a great house and a great Kiva and usually a circle of berms, uh, earthen berms and roads, a little hard to see the road there, but uh, roads are tying all this stuff together. Um, so it's a landscape. Uh, it's not just the architecture, I mean, it's architecture, but it's, it's earthen architecture, it's built environment, it's whatever, it's landscape architecture. And John Stein and I, John was with the PNM group, and I was, of course, with the, with the uh, Park Service group, wrote a paper called Honest Size Ritual Landscapes, which is, I think, the first time that term was used in the Southwest, way ahead of the British invasion later. And this is an older map. I mean, people are still updating these maps now, but all the little circles and triangles and um, squares are all uh, these small Chaco outliers, small great houses. And the red lines are uh, what we call roads. They weren't roads in the modern sense, like, you know, the pavement thing outside your house there. But they certainly connected stuff and uh, people moved on them. And they're both monuments and history written on the ground and they're, you know, the, the political system written on the ground. Because there was a lot of work to build and everybody had to get together and build it. So, you know, it was a reminder that you were part of a larger thing. So yeah, area to, again, the size of Indiana and the size of Ireland, I suppose, uh, with a clear center. I mean, Chaco is clearly the center. So it's a capital in a region. So remember the scale of societies we're studying here. There's nothing in the Southwest like this that, that Professor Dobbins ever studied. I mean, that, that this never happened uh, in, modern, in modern Pueblos or in, in Pueblos after 1300. Um, so yeah, you know, what do we compare Chaco to? It is part of Pueblo history, and a lot of people are involved in it, or Pueblo people today, but they weren't living like Pueblo people uh, do today. So they went off the air for about 10 years. And, um, I was at the Arizona State Museum doing contract work until 1990, and then I was uh, the curator of uh, archaeology, I believe, at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. And then I got hired away from there to run Crow Canyon for a few years. And you know, pretty much didn't have a lot of research time. Uh, these are all well, yeah, this was contract. So yeah, I mean, it's researching all the time, but uh, this one and this one, uh, Santa Fe Museum of Arts and Culture and Crow Canyon were pretty much full-time jobs. But one of the cool things about working at Museum of Arts and Culture is we worked with a lot of Indian people. I worked with a lot of Indian people at Chaco, they're all Navajos, and they knew a lot about the place. And I worked with Indian people down Tucson, the Tohono O'odham folks. But at Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, there are mostly Rio Grande uh, Pueblo guys that are working with us, you know, and by guys, I mean, you know, artists and poets and community leaders and whatever. And many occasions, I was pushing Chaco because, you know, this is a New Mexico museum. Uh, I was doing the archaeology for the, I supposedly doing the archaeology for this big exhibit we were planning. I said, you know, in New Mexico, you got members and you got Chaco that are world famous. Let's focus on those and not forgetting everyone else, of course, not forgetting everyone else, but really focusing on, on, on those guys. Um, and the Indians were kind of dubious about both of those, but especially Chaco. And I heard versions of this a number of times in Santa Fe. We know all about Chaco. This is a Pueblo person speaking. And it, you know, a, a very articulate, well-connected Pueblo person. We know all about Chaco. We don't talk about it. Bad things happen there. And that really put a new spin on my thinking that, yeah, okay, Chaco's got some history. And that history isn't necessarily pleasant. You know, this is shortly after the harmonic convergence and all the new age stuff that everybody's saying Chaco's a very spiritual place. Well, you know, a lot of Pueblo people don't think much of Chaco at all. I mean, it's part of their heritage, it's part of their history, but it's not a proud chapter. And I get to thinking about the archaeology that I hadn't been able to do while I was at, at Santa Fe or at Crow Canyon. And I really got to think about Pakime, and I'll show you more of that in a minute, about Casa Strandes, another name for it, down in Chihuahua. And I'd done work at Aztec, like I said, I knew a fair amount about Aztec, I knew a bit about Chaco, and it, yes, and things lined up, let's put it that way. Uh, this is shortly after I left Crow Canyon, I think. I was plotting stuff on a map for some other purpose and noticed that all these things are north south of each other. And we knew that Aztec was you know, north of Chaco, uh, but nobody made much of it. Now Hayes, who was one of my heroes in the Park Service, had pointed out at one time that Pakime was south of those things. And he said it once in a meeting and never, never <laughs> mentioned it again. But I said, okay, fine, you know, there's some history here. And, Aztec is north of Chaco. We know it's intentional because they built the Great North Road linking the two, and it's pretty much due north until topography intervenes. And if they could move north from Chaco to Aztec, they could go to Pacume if they wanted to. I mean, technology's there. I mean, they knew how to do it. Uh, just a question of time and effort, and why would you want to? Well, that's a whole other story. 
So it goes bing, bang, boom. Tacos make 50 to 1125. I'm doing it now. Aztecs kicks in right when Taco ends, and Pocky May kicks in right when, when Aztec ends. So I said, this is history, all right? And oddly enough, you know, this is archaeology. You think everything would be history, but no, you know, in the 80s and 90s, they didn't talk about history, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It wasn't about history, it was about um, science and pro processes, and history was sort of background noise that you had to filter out. So, you know, this is history that structured the political history, uh, um, structure of the entire Southwest, at least outside of Phoenix and, and Tucson, the Hokan area. Um, and I got going on it, and I did a lot of public lectures before I published on it. Uh, I went to the National, I was invited by somebody who heard me do a talk on it to the National Science Writers Convention in Boston, I think it was, uh, where all the science writers get together and, and drink heavily, uh, but also listen to a bunch of scientists and, and get stories. And you know, somebody invited me there, I can't remember who. Uh, so I talked about it there and it gets in the newspapers um, and some of them even got it right. And you know, I wrote something in Archaeology Magazine because they didn't all get it right. Uh, and this is before I actually published a book about it. But I finally had a chance on a Crow Canyon trip in October 97 to do the whole line from Chaco, Aztec to, to Pakime with a, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center uh, clientele is very, usually very well informed you know, supporters. So let's say clientele supporters, very well informed about archaeology. Uh, and they were intrigued because they'd read about this stuff in the newspaper, maybe. Um, and, but this particular trip had a lot of really interesting people on it to ask really good questions. I, I always loved going on these trips because people, the smart people, would listen to me and say, why are you saying that? How can you say that? And I'd rock back and go, that's a very good question. <laughs> how, how, how can I support that statement? But there's people like Roger Kennedy, who was the head of the, uh, uh, the American History Museum at Smithsonian, and later the head of the Park Service. And Peter Pino, who was governor of, of Zia Pueblo. And I, I did a lot of work with both these guys uh, subsequently. Um, and yeah, really, uh, lots of other people too, but especially those two, uh, really, it really sharpened the arguments. It was really cool. Uh, and this was an experience that really uh, helped the argument out quite a bit. And at the end of the trip, Peter Pino, who is a traditional man, and he's governor of, of Zia Pueblo, also a composer and a singer of songs, uh, in Tewa songs, um, he brought us all together and he sang us a song in Tewa about the Chaco Meridian. And he might have been singing, I know this guy named Lexan who's really full of it, but I, I don't think so. I think he accepted that and he actually brought back a bunch of, and he's very well connected obviously as a governor. Um, he, he spread the word and he brought down, the next year I wasn't part of this, a bunch of elders from a number of Pueblos to do the same trip, which is very cool. You can't cite that, but I like that a lot. So I finally sprung it on, on officially uh, in a poster at the Society of American Archaeology meetings in 1996. And the poster was, this is back in the days, this is before you do something on PowerPoint and take it to Kinko's and print it out. This is all cut and paste stuff on, on uh, black phone core panels. And there's like eight of these panels. And I had just a wonderful time putting this thing together. As many trips to, you know, to the copy machine and you know, it was great. It was like being back in grade school or something, all the cut and paste stuff. And uh, I had some fun with it. And by golly, it won the poster prize. <laughs> I won the science fair in 1996. I'm very proud of that. And I, I should point out that they got rid of this award about two years later, I think, because I won. <laughs> because this poster won. Because people didn't like the poster at all, uh, but it still won the award. Okay, so the book finally comes out in 1999, Chocolate Meridian, which is not my title. It was the publisher's title. So basically it says Aztec, uh, Chocolate moves to Aztec, which moves to Pocky Man. And there's a lot of evidence to support this. Um, mostly architectural evidence, again, you know, architecture, but lots of other stuff subsequently is, yeah, you know, this happened. Certainly everybody did today at the time, this was extraordinarily controversial. And the guys that worked in the San Juan River and wanted to hang me from a tree because, you know, Aztec didn't come from Chaco, Aztec, some local thing up there. Today, it's a four point problem, you know, Chaco, Aztec, Pocky Man North. And everybody accepts that Chaco moved north to Aztec. People still have problems with the whole thing moving south to Pocky May, but there's so, so much stuff that I've learned since that I'm pretty, pretty sure that happened. I mean, it's, it's, it's a stretch. It's a stretch, but I'm pretty sure it happened. Anyway, it caught on. And some grad students down at the University of Arizona had a softball team. That was the Chaco Meridian softball team. And they sent me one of their, their jerseys. It's a, one of my prized possessions. 
So I'm doing other things for all this. I'm working in a member's country. I'm, you know, working at the University of Colorado and museum. I'm doing eight years of NAGPRA, just about well, five years of NAGPRA, really. Uh, this stretched out over eight. Here's the Chaco project, uh, the old National Park Service Chaco project that I worked on until it ended. And the Park Service pulled the plug on it, um, leaving many of the people that worked there fairly bitter because it, it never ended and we never had a final product to come out of it. Uh, this is my shelf. It doesn't even include the stuff I wrote for these guys, but you know it's over two feet of, of technical reports. Um, and you know, whatever that is, 22 um, different volumes of uh, publications, archaeology reports at the Chaco Center of various aspects, but no one thing that pulled it all together. And Joan Mathian, who was one of the people that uh, from the old Chaco project that stayed with the Park Service, most of us went scattered to the winds. She was working on that in 2005, uh, trying to put a single volume together that said, this is what the Chaco project did. And it's great, this is a great volume. I'm pulling this off the shelf all the time. Uh, it deserves a much wider distribution than it got because it's, again, a Park Service um, uh, product. So limited distribution, but this is really good. But one of the other old uh, Chaco project guys was Bob Powers. And I, I worked on uh, outlier surveys with him and he stayed in the Park Service. And, uh, uh, Long about 96, he approached me and said, you know, basically what I just said is we did all this work with the Chaco project and there wasn't any, you know, final summation, some transformative kind of thing that, you know, would make it all worthwhile. And he might have wanted me to write a volume like, like Jones um, was doing, um, but, you know, with different than, than the one Joan did. But I decided uh, and talked him into it and he had some money, uh, not Bob personally, but the Park Service had some money to get this done, to have a number of focused working conferences on organization and production and Chaco World, which is the outliers and society and poly and economy, ecology and architecture, and a couple more. It would be led by younger people or, or people that I identified and talked into doing this and they would invite people in. And I insisted that they invite not just younger people, but also people from the outside, Mississippi archeologists, uh, Mexican archeologists, I, uh, England, we had a guy come in from work, Colin Renfrew came in from England uh, for one of these things. And they're all over the place. One was at University of Colorado, one of these meetings, one was at Arizona State, one was in Fort Lewis, one was at University of Arizona, uh, one was out at Chaco. Uh, and there's all these moving parts and it's not really a cast of thousands, it was a cast of hundreds. Uh, and the idea was that the organizers of each of these smaller sessions, I went to all of them, uh, obviously, and you know, help pick and choose. And you know, mainly what I was doing was, was paying for dinner. Uh, that the organizers would distill what they learned there. Uh, they put they put out a product, a book, uh, a journal, an issue with all the different papers and stuff. And they distill that, and we we move that up to a final, you know, transformative volume or something like that, which came through this mechanism. Uh, those are mostly the leaders of the different sessions, and a few other folks brought in. Uh, at the School of American Research uh, in May 2004, and I added some more people. You know, during the course of this discussions, like you know, everybody agreed, oh, we need something, to, somebody to address this, and somebody address that. So I added about five more chapters, and it came out as a book in, in 2006, the Archaeology of Chaco Canyon. Uh, the on the lower tier here are some of the products from the smaller meetings, and the smaller meetings are pretty big. You know, whole issue of Kiva that, that John Cantor took over on Chaco, the region, and Chaco outliers. And, the organization of production, uh, Kathy Cameron and Milwaukee Toll took over a whole issue of American antiquity. And I'm very proud that we subvented the first color illustrations of American antiquity in hundred years or something like that. Uh, Society and Polly, Linda Cordell and Jim Judge. And then I, I did the architecture volume and, and, and all those led into uh, this volume plus a few new chapters, but there were no Indians, no Indians involved. Uh, that was not by design. I mean, the original design was to integrate Indians. I wanted to have a, a writer or two or three and attend all the different meetings and report out what they thought about it. Um, problem is that Chaco Canyon at that point is right in the middle of a fierce NAGPRA problem between the Navajos who lived around Chaco and who Chaco employed and the park was very partial to the Navajos being part of the story and the Pueblo people who didn't want Navajos at the table. And you know, if I had picked a Pueblo person to tell the story, the park would be upset because there's no Navajos. If I had picked a Navajo person to tell a story, the Pueblos would go through the roof. I mean, I, I had discussions. They, they went through the roof. There were actual physical holes. They went through the roof. Um, I finally tried to get a Native American person who was neither. 
and Kiowa guy, an archaeologist, who's a good writer. And I told him what he wanted to do. And he said, I'm not touching that. You know, that's got to be some Southwest tribe. And eventually I just gave up. Fortunately, other people covered the turf, especially uh, um, at the same time, unrelated to our project. And it only came out in 2010, but unrelated to our project, there was a Camera One uh, production on Chaco that basically used all of Chaco's Native American Advisory Board, who I've been talking to all this time. And they, you know, they, they were sympathetic to the fact that I couldn't find a writer that would please everyone. But they all appear in this video. There's almost no archaeologists in the video. So it's, that's all Indians all the time. And then Dave Noble, uh, the book on the bottom, who uh, attended several of the meetings. I invited him in the, some of the meetings, especially the last one, which is School of American Research. And he's affiliated with School of American Research, writes books for him. Dave Noble basically high graded the authors from my book, from Ar Archaeology of Chaco Canyon. He got those guys, most of them, excuse me, and said, okay, write it again in English. <laughs> Let's get rid of the archaeology jargon. You know, there's, it's full archaeology, but, but he did a marvelous job. I don't know how much editing he did, but you know, everybody got on board with it. And this is a great book in search of Chaco because it's got all the guys that were involved in our project writing in accessible ways. Plus, Dave Noble was not Park Service. See, I couldn't make a decision on a native author because it, would, it was a Park Service project. I was funded by the Park Service. And it would seem like I was saying, yes, it's Pueblo, or yes, it's Navajo, if I, if I did that. But Noble didn't have that constraint. So he got some really good people, Lee Cohen Wissimo, I mean, Swensel, and, and Tim Gay, all the people I know, um, to write chapters. So that's, you know, that, that integrated it quite a bit. I had actually invited Brian Fagan, who's a famous archaeologist writer, to write a popular book about the Chaco Synthesis Project. He came to a couple of meetings, uh, not all of them, and he, he basically latched on to Glenn Vivian, who's great. He's, Glenn Vivian's Mr. Chaco, uh, practically grew up out there, down at the University of Arizona. He's retired now. Uh, but his book has uh, pretty much a Glenn Vivian spin on it. Glenn and I uh, love the man, uh, but we disagree about a lot of stuff. I mean, Glenn, Glenn wouldn't see nobles and commoners. And that's a huge divide right there. And Gwen thinks it's an egalitarian place. I see novels and commoners and everything else spins off in different directions. So I don't come off well in Brian's book, even though I invited him and, and paid, you know, I didn't pay him to write it, but we made it easy for him to write. The whole budget for this thing was about uh, 214, $215,000 from the Park Service, which we doubled. You know, I, I like wheeling and dealing, so we got lots of matches and cont contributions and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, it's about 4% of the total project costs for the Chaco project, which is this big elaborate, you know, turned out to be 15, 20 year field project. While this is going on, Professor Kathy Cameron, who happens to be my wife, uh, she gets a job as a professor at the University of Colorado. And uh, I was looking for a field project related to Chaco that, that she can use uh, as a field school for the University of Colorado. And settles on the Bluff Great House. And I have a long history at Bluff Great House, which I think I'll pass on uh, in the interest of moving forward. Uh, but I was the co-PI, the principal investigator, for the first three years of that project, and she continued working there until 2004. After 1998, I went back south in southern New Mexico and got involved in, in more members archaeology down there. Um, the main thing I got out of the Bluff Great House, I mean, you know, it was great stuff um, going on there, um, but I got to spend time in southeastern Utah, which I knew there were outliers in Chaco presence in southeastern Utah, but I, I really got to see it because we got to know the local archaeologists and, you know, they'd take me around and show me stuff. And that, that was, that was uh, terrific. And these are all scenes from the Bluff Great House. Okay, so I, I come back to see you and I'm curating and doing NAGPRA and doing all this other stuff, minding my own business and, and working down south in the members country. In 2009, the Forest Service shows up and says, how would you like to dim, dig chimney rock? And uh, this is Julie Coleman, uh, who is actually working through the Friends of Chimney Rock Association, which is a sort of parallel nonprofit that helps out down there. But it's a Forest Service site. And uh, the site, if you've never been to Chimney Rock, go. It's my, my favorite sticky up site in the Southwest uh, for stuff that goes down. It's part of the Canyon de Shea, but for stuff that's up in the sky, is Chimney Rock. It's on this, this knife edge ridge that's a thousand feet above Stolzheimer Creek on one hand and the Pieta River on the other. And the two big pinnacles there, one's Chimney Rock, the other's Companion Rock, um, they play games, the moon plays games with them on some sort of 18 year cycle that is beyond my ability to comprehend. But there's something the moon does every 18, six year, 18.6 years that has it. If you were at the Great House, which you can see there, 
the moon comes up in between those two pillars and then it doesn't for another 18.6 years. So the Colorado Historical Society dug a lot of it in the 20s and then Frank Eddy from CU had gone down there for a couple of years and this is 2009. They wanted us to go down and uh, uh, reduce the fill in some rooms. There were, from the earlier excavations, there were rooms that were wide open and clear to the floor and right next to them was a room that's still full of rubble. And the filled up room sort of acts like a sponge and then the water would filter through the walls and the walls are just made of you know, rock and mud and it's not good for them. So they wanted us to reduce the fill. And I said, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, but you know, I've dug great houses before and the upper, upper fill is good exercise and that's about it. <laughs> you, know, you don't learn a lot from the upper, upper rubble. We'll do that if you let us take a quarter of each room down to bedrock, down to the floor, through the floor to bedrock. I mean, that was fun. This is one of the, it was a single season, but one of the most fun seasons I've, I've ever been involved with. This turned into a dissertation project for Brenda Todd, who's uh, dis did her dissertation at CU on Chimney Rock. And she's one of my success stories. She's now a superintendent in the National Park Service. And I think she just moved to Badlands um, National Monument. But yeah, I mean, she's way up there in the Park Service. Uh, I like it when people have actual jobs. Uh, you know, it's a great place to dig. Uh, when Frank Eddy, the early 1920s excavations didn't produce tree ring dates because it was before tree rings. Um, they just threw the wood out. Uh, when Frank Eddy worked there, the two rooms he worked in uh, were all 1093. They're all built, you know, hundreds of you know, dozens of dates in 1093, cutting dates, uh, Denver dates. So we got a bunch of wood and a lot of it dated 1093 because we're right next to the room where Frank Eddy was working. But we also got some earlier dates that were built in to the roof, cutting dates um, at 1011 and 1018 and 1076. Well, 1093 is one of these lunar standstills. So is 1011, so is 1018. It's not the major lunar standstill, it's a minor lunar standstill, but it's the, the 1076, same thing. The, the only, the cutting dates that we had that were earlier than 1093, every one of those cutting dates was a lunar, involved in the lunar shenanigans. There were lunar shenanigans in 1037 and 1056. We didn't have dates that, that, that matched that, but you know, we only dug two quarters of two rooms. Um, pretty clearly they were building stuff up there as early as 1011. You know, building something because this, this is architectural wood. This isn't like loose wood just lying around. And then rebuilding and rebuilding and incorporating the old wood from the old ceilings into the moderns in the newer ceilings. So this 1093 roof had stuff from 1011, 1018, 1076, and at each one of those four was a lunar thing, you know, lunar uh, event. Um, and yeah, and that's you know that's not by chance. Let's put it that way. Okay, my last. Involvement here uh, was Tom Lincoln, who is the, he's like the regional archeologist, but he had a different title, you know, chief of cultural resources, something like that. So the National Park Service Intermountain Region, which includes the Southwest and Colorado and, and a couple of states to the North. He was the, the chief archeologist for all that. And again, it includes New Mexico and, and uh, Chaco. He came to me in, well, first in 2005, but we don't have time to talk about that. But in 2013, he said he had some year end money and would I want to do a project on Chaco landscapes? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to retire. I don't think so. You know, why would, you know, what's the point? And he said, well, you know, Tom had his ear to the ground and he knew that there was going to be an explosion of, of energy development, fracking in the San Juan Basin, the area around Chaco Canyon. And he said, look, this is probably going to happen. We don't have the tools in um, our cultural resource management laws and regulations to deal with these kinds of landscapes, these Chaco landscapes with roads and this and that and the other thing. And what we need is you know, something for agency archeologists and historic preservation officers and things like that to refer to, to, you know, to get them in, not on the ground floor, but to make these things intelligible to management. You no, know, you can't put well pads everywhere uh, unless you look for roads first, because good luck finding a Chaco road in that mess that you're seeing right there. I mean, it's, it's gonna be gone. Um, so I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. But what I'm going to do is get some younger people involved and I'll, you know, I'll be the, I don't know, degrees or whatever. But got Ruth Van Dyke, who had written a lot about Chaco landscapes and experience with Chaco Canyon. Uh, she's in New York. And Carrie Heitman, who uh, is also a Chaco scholar, who had actually worked at the Bluff Great House back in the day, um, who had the Chaco Research Archive, an online uh, resource that was just amazing. And, you know, was interested in Chaco landscapes. And, uh, Worked with them, those two women, but you know it's mainly their their work organizing again a series of conferences 
uh, that culminated in this, this book, the Greater Tribal Landscapes, just came out. It's a really good book. Um, they built in Indians from the get-go. This is one of the final conferences. Um, I'm off on the left there. Again, you know, at this point, my role is, is basically saying what I think and, and paying for dinner, you know, paying for people's hotel rooms and stuff like that and, and getting the logistics going. But there's a gentleman on the right, like the guy in the light uh, blue shirt is uh, Phil Tolwesto, a healthy guy that I've worked with a lot. And some other folks that I know back there, I think Ernie Vial and you know, a bunch of Native Americans right from the get-go. And at this meeting, this is a meeting that, that basically was a step before the, the book they just published. They wanted, they asked, we asked the Native American people, please write something. And he said, well, we don't really want to sit there and write an academic paper you know, like you guys, uh, this is what you guys do for a living, but, you know, we, we have better things to do, in who, and, and they're quite right, who is right mind, want to write an academic paper, it's just, you know, terrible. Um, maybe there's some other way we can, we can communicate what we want to say, because we do want to say stuff, and I'm speaking, paraphrasing what the Native American people said, and we had been working with a, a videographer guy, Larry Ruiz from Cloudy Ridge Productions, to, to video this whole conference, I wanted to do that, just on principle, but uh, Larry Rees and Ruth and Carrie all get together with the Indian people and they say, what about video? And they did that. And uh, Carrie in particular, and well, Ruth's down there too, with Larry uh, and his crew. Um, they took a bunch of these guys down to Chaco and we had enough money left over for this. Uh, down to Chaco and we'll let them rip, let them say what they wanted to say. And then it, it, that's hooked into the book. You got chapter six. I, I'm not sure if this is quite true, but chapter six by Ernie Vio. And they give you a, a URL, a, a link, and which is being maintained. This video is being maintained by the University Press of Colorado, who published the book. So they're getting their say, they're getting it in video that their own people can see. They don't have to sit there and slog their way through an academic book. Um, you know, their kids can see this stuff. And you know, anybody can see this stuff. It's open access for the videos. I'm coming out of this uh, thinking, you know, Chaco has a class society. It's an urban center with a region. I mean, it's a political system. Everybody else wants it to be a program center. It can be that too. I don't care. Uh, or, you know, just there's a horrible tendency just to think it's, it's religious. You know, it's all ceremonial. Therefore, we don't have to think about it because we, we'll never understand it anyway. But yeah, it, it's a thousand. Well, I'll get back to this in a second. But, you know, for me, no, it's, it's all those other things, perhaps. Uh, but it's certainly a political system and probably an economic system. And I started hanging out with these guys. Gerardo Gutierrez is a colleague here at University of Colorado who does archaeology in Mexico, ancient archaeology and historic archaeology, but also he's very, very knowledgeable about Northeast Mexico and Northwest Mexico. And since he's working for the University of Colorado, he's gotten interested in the Southwest. And Tim Pocatet, who's uh, my go-to guy for Mississippi Valley. Uh, he's done a lot of work around Cahokia and, and some, to my mind, some of the most interesting work. I mean, there's a lot of good Mississippian archaeologists out there, but the three of us went again on a Crow Canyon trip together. And it was just great, you know. Um, get three of us with an audience <laughs> and a fair amount of wine and everything. And we just, it was great. I just learned a ton from these guys and particularly, well, for both of them. But it made me think about Chaco in larger contexts that, you know, Chaco's world didn't end at the border and at the U.S. border. And it certainly didn't end at the Great Plains. Uh, they were part of this larger uh, post-classic Mesoamerica and the Cahokian Mississippi Valley. And the stuff that I was subsequently writing, History of Ancient Southwest, very consciously in each chapter, which is a segment of time, says what was going on in Mexico, what was going on in Mississippi Valley, what was going on in Chaco, what was going on in Hocom, what was going on in Muggy uh, Second edition of Chaco Meridian, same thing, and study Southwest archaeology is all, all about this. But I was trying to answer a question that Lynn Sebastian, who was part of the Chaco Synthesis, an important part of the Chaco Synthesis project, said if Chaco fit neatly into some straightforward organizational box based on the modern historical Southwest world, like a Pueblo, we would have found that box, but it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, Chaco doesn't work. It's got a capital, a region, and classes, and all that stuff. It doesn't work. But you know, thinking about it like Taos, or thinking about it like Zuni. Again, again, it's part of Pueblo history, but it wasn't a Pueblo, uh, Pueblo society. This does not mean that Chaco is some unique specimen. No, I wouldn't think so because it's a thousand AD. You know, for two millennia, they've been doing empires and states and stuff in Mexico for two thousand years before Chaco was a twinkle in anybody's eye. What's more likely is we haven't looked at enough boxes. And Gerardo Gutierrez, my good friend and colleague, 
Now, I'd been looking in Mexico, looking at the Aztec Empire and the Tarascan Empire, and Chaco wasn't that. I mean, remember the scale of societies we're studying. Chaco wasn't the Aztec Empire, nor was it the Tarascan Empire. Gerardo pointed me towards El Tepetl's, which is what the Aztec Empire was made of. It's these small polities that the, the, the Aztecs conquered, and it's a very, very common system where you have nobles and commoners, the half dozen noble families and rotating kingship. You know, the king is, comes from different families. After the king dies, his son doesn't become king. It's from another noble family. So you, know, you don't have one, one noble family that takes over. It's both a city and the countryside. The El Tepetl is, it means both a central city and then the countryside around it. It's inseparable. Tribute and taxes flow into the, the, the center and it's the right scale. Remember the scale of societies we're studying. The, the central cities are like 3,000 people. That's chocolate size. The whole polity was like 30 to 50,000 people. Chaco's, you know, spread over a much larger distance with um, area, but it's like 60,000, 70,000 people in its region. That's the right scale. Old well, Dobbins was right. You know, remember the scale of societies that we're, we're studying. And this is a, a diagram, my diagram, based on James Lockhart and her, and other people study all temples and Gerardo, of course. But it looks something like this, where the big uh, hexagons are the great houses, the palaces in the central city. Uh, the small ones are minor nobility out in the countryside. And they're all surrounded. These are the big bumps, and the little dots are the small bumps, the commoner houses. And each each one's like a pizza pie. Uh, each major family has its own territory to mark where the the tribute flows, and and it's not burdensome tribute. We're not talking about you know slaves of Egypt or something. It's just so much corn or so much time uh, labor or whatever that the commoners owe the owe the the nobles, and the nobles then take care of things. They make sure it rains, and they you know if they get invaded there, the guys they have to go out and get chopped. Chocolate chutney. Anyway, Chaco's Alta Pelle, yeah, it had nobles and commoners. And there's a half dozen of those great houses that are clearly bigger than the rest. And uh, there's all kinds of smaller great houses, but it's a city. So you have all kinds of different buildings. I mean, some of the smaller great houses are really warehouses. But there's six of them that had time depth and size and probably were the centers for noble families. The region is definitely a city and the countryside. And tribute taxes, Chaco's like a great black hole. It sucks everything into it. Um, you know, it's tribute and taxes. That's the right scale. That's the end of me and Chaco. Um, think, think, figured it out. I, I figured it out to my satisfaction. All right, so we'll open it up for questions. Uh, uh, thank you so much. This was entirely fascinating from Julie Myers. And okay, any questions? You mentioned tribute, but didn't say how much about it. What are your ideas about that for Chaco? That's from Alan Dart. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into Chaco. Uh, I don't know how far to get into this. Pretty clearly, there's a number of sort of scientific analyses you can do about, you know, where did this corn grow or where, where, where did this deer grow up? And it really looks like a lot of foods coming into Chaco. Uh, certainly the, certainly the meat, uh, the major meat is coming into Chaco, which, you know, if they're living there from 500 AD, there wouldn't be too many large animals left anyway. So. Uh, most of the pottery, I think, you know, for sure, by the end, anyway, um, say for sure about half and probably more like three quarters or, or I wouldn't be surprised if all of it, uh, all the pottery is imported towards the end. Um, there's no fuel for making pottery at Chaco. I mean, that's a problem. I mean, you've been living there for centuries and everything that you can burn has been cut down and put in fire pits. So you're going to make the pot. Somebody's making the pottery up in the hills where there's wood and fuel, um, which isn't Chaco. Um, even the stone. I mean, there's a couple of decent stone, uh, uh, tool stones in Chaco, but an awful lot of the stuff they're using for, for tools uh, is coming in from elsewhere. Um, I'm forgetting stuff here. But, you know, oh, little bulk stuff. I mean, this isn't, well, this could be tribute. I mean, three quarter, half, is it half a million? 250,000 uh, beams at least, and probably many more are coming from 50, 60 miles away. So all mm -hmm. stuff's going into Chaco, all right? Now, if you want to put a, a particular spin on it, you could say, well, these are happy, happy people bringing in stuff for ceremonies. Uh, sure, you know, you might sell it that way. I mean, it, it's, it, what, however it's getting there, it's acting like taxes, because clearly you've got noble families who are not making their own pottery, they're not hunting their own deer, people are bringing them that stuff, probably not growing their own corn. Uh, people are bringing them that stuff, either from inside the canyon or outside the canyon. Um, you can, you know, again, you can put a spin on it if you want to try real hard and turn it into some voluntary offering on a, on a pilgrimage. But why would you do that when you, you know everywhere else? <laughs> again, nobles and commoners are 
everywhere there's agricultural societies north of Panama in the 11th century, almost, almost, you have nobles and commoners that operate like that, where you know, they, they have tribute. And again, it's not onerous. It's just, you know, every once in a while, you owe know, this guy a deer. Um, or, you know, you know this, uh, a deer to a big city or some time of labor or something like that to the big city. Um, so it's that kind of stuff. It's not money. Uh, it's conceivable these guys had some kind of, of coinage, but you know, not really coinage, but you know, something that uh, like he like uh, beads, you know, might have meant something. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't think it's taxes in that sense, uh, but it's stuff that you owe, stuff you in the countryside owe the people in the middle of the altepital. Okay. Yes, I I noticed some of the other people are asking this similar question. I've long been fascinated by the connection between Chaco and Mexico yeah. um, because uh, the Aztec empire was happening at some sometime later than Chaco, yeah. but not a lot later. Uh, but there were plenty of other um, trading groups there. And then Cahokia was a, uh, a contemporary of Chaco uh, for quite some time. And so do you know if anyone has written a book or... Uh, it explored the relationships between those groups um, just in, in a book or? I, I tried to do that in history of the ancient Southwest. Okay. Um, I mean, I was, I was trying to contextualize Chaco by saying, what, what's going on in Mexico? What's going on in Mississippi Valley? And yeah, I do get into that some. Uh, you know, clearly there's all kinds of stuff from Mesoamerica at Chaco. I mean, there's macaws and, you know, stuff that actually originated probably in West Mexico, copper belts. It's, you know, Mesoamerica is not one monolithic thing. I mean, uh, West Mexico, the people that work, the archeologists work in Central Mexico are not even sure that West Mexico is Mesoamerica, you know, it's, it's, but it's got civilizations and cities and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the Mayans were big uh, uh, sea traders. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a lot of evidence that they, uh, they traded all along the coast of Texas and uh, up the Mississippi River and all yeah. of that. And much of, I was really impressed at Cahokia, how their mounds and stuff resemble, really resemble the shape and structure and height of some of the um, early Mayan pyramids. Oh yeah, they're pyramids, they're pyramids. Yeah. And uh, you know, the biggest one at, at uh, Cahokia, it's called Monk's Mound, uh, is the biggest pyramid north of Teotihuacan, um, mm -hmm. you know, by, by area and volume. Um, because there are, don't get me started on this. This is the last book, uh, Study uh, Southwestern Archaeology. Anthropology, I how to say this. The study of the, the history of ancient North America should not be an anthropology at all. It should be in history where it belongs. It's not a natural science. It's a history discipline. And we're writing history just using different, different uh, kinds of data. We don't have written documents, but we got lots and lots of evidence that we can, we can deal with. If you say American anthropology did not, starts off as racist in the 1880s. Uh, you know, we were still fighting wars with Indians and uh, the first anthropologist, Lewis Henry Morgan, was pretty sure that he liked Indians. He's trying to help Indians. He's pretty sure they never had a civilization and they never had cities and never any of this stuff. He didn't, Lewis Henry Morgan didn't believe the Aztecs had an empire. I mean, he, he thought that none of these new world people literally were capable of that kind of thing. He's a smart guy, not a bad guy, and he certainly wasn't anti-Indian, but the, the, he set the rules, and we still, after generations of teachers handing this down, it's still in, in you know, Archaeology 101 of North America, it's, it's, simple, it's simply assumed that there are no states north of Mexico. There are never any Native American states, and certainly not empires, I, mean, I'm not, I don't think they're empires, but anything that looked like a government north of the border, and that's just nonsense. I mean, Cahokia and Chaco, it, Cahokia really looks like a Mesoamerican city, and it is uh, inspired by it anyway. They're, or, or, or they're all part of the same world. It's not like Mesoamericans are coming up there and building pyramids. It's just the guys at Cahokia are really powerful. The people, the men and the women, really powerful, probably went down there. They're, they're, that was part of their, their job as rulers, is to know what the hell's going on you know, at distance. And vice versa, the guys from Mesoamerica probably going up there, checking on the guys up in the, um, you know, basically the boonies, um, North America. Uh, or the north edge of it. Same thing with Chaco. I mean, you got uh, chocolate, cacao uh, coming up, you know, maybe from the Maya country. Uh, some of the codices talk about turquoise coming down, not through the Maya uh, mariners, but by sea. Uh, you know, it gets bundled up someplace, probably Chaco. 
and picked up by ships uh, in the Gulf of California and sailed down to the, the Oaxaca where the Mixtec uh, craftsmen make all these turquoise encrusted skulls and stuff. I mean, there's actually accounts of this. Uh, so yeah, it's all very connected. And when I say that Chaco is an altepetl, I don't mean that the Aztecs came up and turned it into an altepetl. It's just that they're forming a government probably for the first time in the Southwest, maybe not, first time in the Southwest, that would be the model that they would have. That would be part of their world. They would know about those cities down in Mexico and they would know that, oh yeah, they have, they figured out a way to have a number of noble families uh, and kind of keep that equal. So, you know, one noble family doesn't take over the whole show. Um, that would be the model they have. And, and like Lynn Sebastian says, said that we couldn't find a, a model in, Southwestern anthropology, because the public the public's don't do stuff like this, but we haven't looked far enough. So I looked a little further down to Mexico, you know that that's part of the world, right? They know about that. And there's a model down there that fits chocolate like a glove. It doesn't mean that Mes Mexicans, Mex Mesoamericans came up and imposed it. It's the local guys, I think, saying, okay, we're ready to have a state now. How, how should that work? And having an idea uh, from the shared traditions of all across North America of how that might work. Okay, from George Hickerson, um, any plans uh, for the future you can share? I'm not mixing it up in the field anymore. Um, yeah, I'm retired. Um, and I may have written my last book, a Southwest book, technical book, the study of Southwest archaeology. Like I said, it's supposed to be three books. And I kind of got tired of it and just jammed it all into one book. I, I kind of had plans for three different volumes. But um, I'm done with that. Um, no, no, not really. Um, you know, I I like to go visit mounds in the Mississippi Valley these days. <laughs> and I, I would really like to go to the Huasteca, to northeastern Mexico, <coughs> Sahin and, and those places that uh, are actually Maya, uh, speak, you know, Maya speaking native people. But they're right on the edge of, your lady earlier was mentioning that, uh, you know, might go from the Maya right up in Mississippi Valley. And I, I think, that's been archaeologists, US archaeologists have been forbidden to think about that, literally. I mean, if you worked at Cahokia and you mentioned Mesoamerica, your career was ruined. And I, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I think the younger generation and people like Tim Pocketat, who's willing to take some chances, are starting to think about that again. That's really interesting. And it's a it's a fun thing when you talk about like the Southwest and Mesoamerica. It's a fun thing to talk to uh, Pueblo people about and Navajo people about. Uh, because it isn't contentious at all. I mean, they they're, they are very interested in learning what, I get I get paid to do this stuff, right? They're just interested in it. They, they're getting paid to do, you know, live real lives. Uh, don't get a chance to travel like I do. But it's it's fun talking to native people about this because it's a, not contentious, it's not NAGPRA, it's not anything like that. It's just, it's just history. And, and they're really interested in, they're really, they, I mean, you can't generalize like that, but many Pueblo people I've talked to are very interested in what's going on in Mesoamerica. Um, not just personally, but but in terms of culturally, in terms of their traditions. So I might do some stuff like that. People, the archaeologists that I work with, and they want to see pottery. There's no Cahokia pottery, chocolate, there's no, you know, chocolate pottery. Why would there be? I mean, they had their own pottery. Um, you know, unless it's really, it's really something flashy. Um, there's not a lot of evidence of material interactions. This is a whole other lecture. Uh, you know, from, from historic times, you know that they knew about each other. They did. Uh, Coronado, I can't get into this too much, but Coronado, when he comes in the Southwest, is led by a non-Southwestern Indian straight east to the Mississippi Valley uh, where he's going to find cities. This guy says, you want cities? And I'll take you to cities. And he gets tired of it and they, they murder this guy in the, in the, on the high plains and, and you know, come back to New Mexico. And, and uh, Coronado says, you know, he's lying to us, but he wasn't. He was just trying, he was trying to lead him to the Mississippi Valley. And it, it works the same way with this auto going the other direction. So they knew about each other. The only material evidence that I'm aware of, and it's tentative at this point, is it's spiral mounds, uh, which is sort of a spectacular Mississippian site, um, smaller Cahokia, but, but just in terms of the stuff that came out of it. They have what I'm pretty sure is a cotton uh, lace textile like, like they made in the Southwest. You know, the Holcomb people were big on this and members was big on this, making these open work uh, cotton textiles which are high-end pieces. There's, there's one of them that came out of Cheddar Kettle, the site you can see in the lower right there, a, a bit of one. I probably started off in, in the, the Hoacom country in Southern Arizona. But I think there's a piece of that over in a Mississippian site 
the collections from a Mississippian site at, at Spiral. I'm not aware of you know anything clearly Southwestern back there or anything clearly Mississippian out here. But I think that what, what they're trading, well, I take that back, black drink, sorry, poked a button here. Uh, Patty Crown, who discovered the cacao, the chocolate at Chaco, also discovered a very highly caffeinated thing, uh, uh, Upen Holly uh, residues, uh, called which come from the Gulf Coast, all right, and they're not you know caffeinated. They're not your morning pick me up. They're your morning knock me out. I mean, you see, you drink this stuff and you see stuff, you see things, and you're drinking it in Chaco, and that's coming. That's coming. You know, they're not growing their own. Uh, that's coming from Mississippi Valley. And they, they find it at Cahokia. It's, it's from the Gulf Coast. It doesn't grow at Cahokia either, but they're drinking it at Cahokia and they're drinking it at Chaco. So that's a connection from the east to the west. It's that kind of stuff, like cotton shirts and cacao and, and uh, Yupin Holly and, and high-end stuff. It's not going to be rocks and pots because they have their own rocks and pots, you know, unless it's a really exceptional rock, a really exceptional pot. Anyway, sorry, I forgot about that. Okay, we have another, uh, we have a question from John Richardson. The fifth phase of Pueblo Benito showed an opened up courtyard. Any idea how long this existed or what it, what was uh, going on? I think that might be an error. Uh, I think it was always enclosed, not, well, not the initially, but uh, upper left-hand uh, cell shows the you know, initial Pueblo Benito is 850 to 920, something like that. And I think immediately thereafter, they start enclosing the uh, plaza and as it grows those plaza enclosing walls move further and further out and I'd have to go look at my book again and see what's going on in the middle lower row there where there isn't a closing wall but I think there probably was. Ms. Carlson asked what does a storage door look like compared to other doors? I don't have a picture. Um, look at the bottom uh, the lower right um, exterior doors that people are actually going through are usually T-doors, great big T-doors, you know, those, those open to the outside world. After that, you get these, and this, like this one, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, these things that people even think are windows, where they're halfway up, uh, they're short, they're, you know, two and a half feet tall, um, they have uh, secondary jams, um, which I, is in the picture there, it's a little hard to see. Uh, for sealing them. Uh, so a normal person's door, the sill of the door is down near the floor, just above the floor. All the other doors are these little things that look almost like windows that are high up in the, you know, halfway up the wall. You have to jump through them. And, and usually there's like a step or something, some way to get through them. Uh, they're not easy for people to get through because they're not built for people to get through. They're built to seal. It's like a, a neck on a, a wine bottle. You have a small aperture and you, you have something back in that storeroom and you want to seal it off. You take one of these little doors with those secondary jams and put a, a wood or stone uh, plank and we, we have these things. And then mud all around it and it's, it's like a cork in a bottle. Um, it, yeah, I mean, when you go through Pueblo Benito, especially the, the east side of it, uh, there are walls that look like Swiss cheese. They have so many of these doors in corners and in the middle. And it's, it's a way to get to you know, the two rooms back and, and pull out whatever's stored there without actually going through this room, which is sealed off because it's full of stuff that, you know, you aren't supposed to see or something like that. So it's real clear. Uh, figured out there are storage room doors because those are exactly the doors that you see on all these little cliff cysts in southeastern Utah. <laughs> you know, these little little beehive shaped things that nobody's living in there. I mean, they, they you probably know what I'm talking about. They're way high on the cliff and the doors are exactly these kinds of doors and they have the jams and they have the slabs lying next to them often and you know that's what that's what's going on with a lot of benito doors um anyway i, I for myself i'm completely convinced that most of benito is a warehouse you know it's it's I, warehouse probably the wrong term but is storage uh and only a small portion of benito is actually lived in you only have like 15 families that actually live there in this 500 room building we have a, a follow-up question from Alan. So do you view the tribute as supporting just the noble families in Chaco Canyon or all of the people there? Um, depends on whether you think you can grow corn in Chaco. Uh, most everybody has looked at the issue, says, no, you can't grow corn in Chaco. But there's a fairly vocal group out of uh, University of New Mexico now that says, right, you can grow corn in Chaco. Um, 
if you can grow corn to Chaco, I think all the people are living, the commoners, because there's like five, five percent of the people or ten percent of the people are living in great houses, and ninety percent of the people are living in commoner houses. They're they're either growing corn, they're probably growing corn as much as they can. Um, and maybe they're maybe they're feeding the place. I think that, that some of the tribute that's coming in, including the pottery, you're seeing that at the small sites too. Um, you know, it's being distributed probably by the nobles to the commoners who are the commoners who are working for the nobles, if that makes sense. You got to keep those people alive. They got to have something to eat. Um, personally, you know, you have two schools right now. One that says Chaco is a garden of Eden. I have a little trouble with that. And another school is everybody else saying, no, it's not. You know, it's a, a rough place to grow corn. And look at how many Navajos live there? Because Chaco is a Navajo place and Navajos are good farmers. You know, they, they know how to farm. I asked Dave Brugge, who is uh, gone now, but um, historian of the Chaco Navajos, and I knew more about, well, you know, obviously Navajo people knew a lot about them too, but Brugge's talking to those guys. Um, asked Dave Brugge, you know, Max, how many Navajos ever lived at Chaco Canyon? It's about 200. That's all, about all the place could support. And they all had farms elsewhere too. You know, <laughs> they had a farm, they had a home, and, you know, they'd run sheep and stuff in Chaco. But then they have a farm up in the Chuscas or a farm on Lobo Mesa or someplace where there's actually water. Um, so yeah, it's some index of how human beings, actual human beings, as opposed to archaeologists theorizing about this stuff, actual human beings could could Chaco support a couple hundred on its own resources, and again augmented by by other farms. So I, I don't think they're growing corn in Chaco much. Steve Patchett asks, what bad things per Native American reports happened in Chaco? Uh, when I first was hearing that, when I was working in Santa Fe, they didn't elaborate. And I didn't ask directly, but I was trying to encourage. But, you know, if they wanted to tell me, they would have told me. Uh, there are stories that are public, although the Acoma don't want it to be public, uh, about White House. And there's a whole cycle of these got published. You recorded, and, you know, way back in the day by the Bureau of American Ethnology, and it's published in a, a government, obscure government series that's online, uh, and then republished in a popular, uh, you know, trade book. Uh, in the 80s, in the Yakima leadership really didn't like that. They talk about White House. You know, White House is this wonderful place. It was up there somewhere. And I think White House is Chaco in, in Aztec. It's up to the north. And there's a wonderful place. You know, you had parrots. You had all this stuff. Uh, there's food. Um, but the people behave badly. People got power over people. And that's not right. And people get power over people. I'm talking about nobles. That's not right. And so the spiritual advisors that would eventually become the Kachinas tell the, the right thinking people out at White House, you know, get away from here. Um, and people don't want to do that. And there's actually battles. And some of the Kachinas are killed and some of the people are killed. But eventually the people leave because what's going on at White House isn't right. It isn't the way they're supposed to live. And they move to Acoma. And they go, they go south and you know, it, it, it fits real well. Uh, Babies are dying at Chaco towards the end. Uh, you know, it quits raining. That's the worst thing. It quits raining. You can't you can't live without rain. But mainly, it's the because it's because people are behaving badly, and the bad behavior is getting power over other people. And I've heard Pueblo people talk about this. And stuff happened to Chaco where people had power that they shouldn't have had over people over over supernatural stuff, and that's why it all fell apart. Just since the pandemic. Since I've been doing all these webinars, I've been getting emails from Pueblo people and Navajo people who I think are watching some of these things. And they're saying, well, I've heard this directly to my face at some talks that Lex and you aren't right, but you're getting close. And for some people, some Pueblo people, I, I remember several Pueblo people at lectures saying, Lex and you know, you're getting close. We don't want our kids to hear it from you. That's one reason why I retired you know, from some white guy. And that's a story we tell, we tell, but you're, you're not supposed to tell. But some of the emails I've been getting are pretty graphic about, yeah, they killed babies out there. They did this, they did that. Uh, it was a horrible place. Fact, you know, one email from a Rio Grande Pueblo guy who had watched some of my stuff, I guess, said, you know, he, he didn't say we don't talk about it because bad things happen. He said, we hate the place. Yeah, from Christopher. Steve, in the sixth phase of Chaco, the Heretooth hitherto east-west wall was changed to two segments neither completely east-west any thoughts on that yeah the one on the we're looking at talking about the lower right um 
I think it's the one that's the lower right, maybe it's the lower left. One of them is absolutely east-west, and it was built the same time as that north-south wall was built uh, that bisects the plaza. Um, and the other one goes off at an angle. Uh, you know, we're talking about the plaza and closing walls at the bottom of that image. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, this guy and this guy, and one of them really is east-west, and this is this is really, really good north-south. And I, don't get me started, I can talk about why they, they really wanted it to be north south. They had to play some engineering tricks, really dangerous engineering tricks to have that happen. Um, now, I don't know why they go caddy one of them's caddy one uh, Clearly they're paying attention north, south, east, west when they do these. These aren't so much east, west. Um, they're a little off uh, facing, you know, sort of more facing southeast. The big, big shift, I'm not sure exactly what Dennis's orientation is here. The, the final shift is when they, they turn the whole place cardinal, this north, south wall and the, in the, I think it's this one, the east, west wall. John has a comment in the last visit to Chaco, they mentioned lower left as being true east, west. This guy? Uh, uh, I don't know, I, uh, I'd have to look at my maps. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that most of these earlier walls are a little bit off, not a little bit, you know, several degrees off. I, I think what John is referring to is the picture in the lower right side. Lower right. The, yeah, lower right picture. The lower left wall oh. is east west, yeah. and that yeah, was that according sense. to, and, that's, what I was and that's the true to. east west. The other wall may or oh, may not, they didn't, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, this is my last um lecture. It's been an honor and a pleasure to do this for you, especially all through COVID. Um, I wish you all a uh, very happy holidays. Um, excellent Thanksgiving. I hope there's a turkey left. <laughs> and uh, a very Merry Christmas as well. Barb, I would like to say to everyone, thank you so much for, it sounds dorky, for your service, but <laughs> for, for what you've done for, for us, for all of these lectures, and for all the uh, monthly meeting lectures that you put together for the last three, four years, it has been a phenomenal time. And we've never had a bad lecture. It's just always been interesting and, and a lot of fun. And I want to thank you especially for that.